The reason uh, uh, missionary Larry Ingalls is not with us is because he has the came down with the COVID, so he's uh, uh, not traveling for a while. So keep the Ingalls family in your prayers as he recovers from that, and uh, 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 remind you that tonight uh, we'll be uh, uh, we'll be in what are we in tonight? We'll be in First uh, Corinthians tonight. I hope you come out for that. Good challenge from the word uh, from that that book. And uh, today we're in the book of Luke. So if you'd like to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter twelve, Luke chapter twelve. And as you know, I enjoy going through books of the Bible. I enjoy the book of Luke. It's been a uh, just been a great book for me to study and. Uh, was one of the first uh, books that I preached through, and uh, I always uh, had the conviction, and you probably have already noticed this, that normally on Sunday mornings I'm preaching through the Gospels. And uh, so almost every Sunday morning I'll be going through books of the Bible, but uh, on uh, Sunday morning I go through the Gospels. If you need an outline, hold your hand up. Dick will give you one. He has outlines for the morning message. Just hold your hand up so he can see you. He, he doesn't see too well, uh, but uh, <laughs> his heart's in the right place. Huh? <laughs> the Word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and, uh, and uh, so the Word of God is what, is what we uh, preach through, and uh, uh, ever ever. Preachers all have different things that they like to do, and uh, I like to go through books of the Bible. And uh, so uh, I see Dick didn't get enough out to pass out, but he's got more. Yeah, he's got plenty. I'm going to begin reading in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. If you'd like to just uh, turn your Bibles there and follow along. Uh, Dick has got a few more to pass out. Hold your hand up. He's uh, hard, to, hard to see. Um, Luke 12, beginning of verse 35, Let your loins be girt about, and your lights burning. And uh, ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he return from the wedding, that when he cometh, he knocketh, that they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find them watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he come in the second watch or the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And know this, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour that you think not. When uh, then Peter said unto him, Lord, thou speakest this parable unto us, or even unto all. And the Lord said, uh, Who then is that wise and f uh, that faithful and wise steward, whom the Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion and meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find them so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all that he hath. And uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I uh, thank you for blessing it in the Sunday school hour. I pray now you'll bless it now for the morning service. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you as their personal Savior, may they hear the gospel. And while this message is not dedicated to a straight gospel presentation, it's certainly true that people need to be born again. And I pray if there's one here that's lost that the, today that they might be saved. They might call upon you and be saved. And Lord, I pray for Christians that are here today. I pray that they would hear this uh, uh, great teaching that you gave to your disciples, your believers, and uh, challenging them. And uh, Lord, may we hear the challenge and, and see what our duty is and what we ought to do to be pleasing to you. Bless now your word as it goes forth. May it speak to hearts and may it result in encouragement to the saved that are committed and, and a encouragement for those that aren't to start doing what they ought to do. Bless us, Lord, now. Uh, may your spirit have free rule and reign here today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the exhortation here is to be ready. Look at verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open immediately uh, unto him immediately. So we first we have an exhortation that I started last week so I'm not going to spend a long time on this but the first exhortation that you see here and I had to go back to this because this is what the premise of the rest of the message is. And the premise of this is, is uh, it being prepared and, and so we need to be ready for the Lord's return. Uh, many of us thought the Lord would return years ago. I remember years ago there was uh, 88 reasons why he'd return in 1988. There was a little booklet out uh, that uh, said the Lord was going to return some time ago. And, uh, and uh, we made fun of that. Uh, I made fun of that. But quite frankly, we don't know the hour or the time. But we should be prepared because, uh, quite frankly, uh, all of us are not, tomorrow, uh, not promised tomorrow. Our day to meet the Lord could be today. And uh, uh, God doesn't promise us that we're going to live on and on and on and on. It does us well to be prepared. So uh, what does it mean to be ready? How can we be ready? Well, in verse 35, he talks about uh, getting ready and how do we get ready? He said, uh, uh, let your loins be girt about and your lights burning. The loins being girt about implies working. By working, your loins gird about. And uh, in those days, uh, a lot of the men would wear uh, robes. They didn't wear uh, pants like we did. They didn't. My grandfather had bib overalls. He, he loved to wear them. Now, he was, a, he was a college man, a teacher. But when he was in the garden, isn't that right, Dick? He had to hit his bib overalls on. And uh, uh, what they would do, the, not grandfather, but you, you, these robes, they would gird them up and they would take the the robe uh, that they're wearing and then they were girded up around to make themselves a pair of pants uh, basically they would tuck the bottom back into the waist and then the the robe would hang down on the sides and it would be like a a, a modern uh, or like a, a pair of pants and why well then they can work and they're free to move freedom to move let your loins be girded about we need to we need to gird ourselves up in such a way that we're ready to move and uh, let our loins be girt about and let your lights be burning. Well, uh, we need to be actively working, prepared to work. Uh, uh, we might say instead of that, we might say, uh, uh, roll up your sleeves. Uh, that's a phrase that I remember uh, hearing often. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. You know, there's a lot of Christians that aren't doing anything for the Lord. You know, uh, God didn't call us, any of us. He God called all of us to be active. Uh, he didn't call any of us to be sitting. He called us all to be doing something for the Lord. You say, well, I don't know what I can do. Well, there's a lot of things you could do besides working in and through a church. You can call people in nursing homes. You can, I could wish you could go and visit them. They won't let you visit anybody anymore. But most of them have, have uh, uh, loved ones that could use a call, could use a visit, could use something, a word of encouragement. And so we need to be working. And, uh, and there's different ways of working, even in spreading the gospel. You could be working. You could say, you know, I'm going to do something for the Lord. I'm going to let my light shine. By the way, that's the next one. Be shining. Let your lights be burning. Let your lights be burning. So I don't know how to get my light burning. I don't know how to get working. You know, I got something drastic uh, to, to consider doing. Why not? Why not uh, uh, take some tracks from the track rack or order tracks that you like and, and uh, try to send out 10 tracks a week to people that you know and people that you don't know. Relatives, friends that you're out of contact with and just say, you know, I just thought I'd send this. I hope this is a blessing to you. And by the way, don't pick just any track out. Pick a track out that's a blessing to you. Don't lie. Don't lie. Find a track that speaks to your heart. And then as that speaks to your heart, the Spirit of God brings that to your heart. Why not send them a track each week? Now that's a combination of working and shining. Uh, we need to be shining. It's not so easy to go door knocking anymore they, uh, with the COVID things and everything going on. They, they, they would rather receive a letter than they would to see you at the door probably. But uh, uh, be ready. Uh, uh, would it be nice to be ready by, by doing something like that when he came? And the idea is that when he comes, let him find us working. Let him find us shining. 
Well, I'm not saying that's what you ought to do, but maybe you can think of something else that maybe you ought to do. So to, to be ready, we need to have our loins girt about. We need to be working, and we need to be shining, witnessing, and we need to be watching. And again, look at verse 36, what it says there. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he returned from the wedding. So uh, they were watching. Now, I, I'm not going to get into the uh, ceremonies and the way they dealt, dealt with weddings in those days. But the thought there is, is that uh, when he cometh, that they may knock and open it to him. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I guess I have to touch on a little bit. What they would do is they would go through a wedding ceremony. And uh, this is, sounds kind of different. And and uh, the bride and the groom would leave and they would consummate the marriage and then they would return and they returned to the wedding feast and then the wedding feast took place and if you want to explain all that to a younger person you can do that on your own I'm not going to explain that the thought there is is that when he would return we need to be watching for the Lord's return watching for the Lord's return by the way let's give an analogy to that what is the church waiting for today? Uh, for him taking his bride, and then what after he takes his bride up, then eventually he's going to return, isn't he? And that's the order that's going to take place in the scriptures, isn't it? And we need to understand, we need to be watching for the rapture, waiting, waiting and working, and the rapture takes place, and watching for the Lord's return. Uh, friend, our, our, for my, I, I'm waiting for the rapture. That's when he returns for me. Amen. We hear that voice, the sound of the trumpet, and boom, up we go. You could have all my fishing poles. <laughs> I'm leaving them all behind. I'm taking my boat. No, I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> But we need to be working, we need to be shining, we need to be watching, we need to be knowing, verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find them watching. Verily I say unto me that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Wow. That's it. We need to be prepared for the Lord, knowing that he's going to come for us. And when he comes for us, again, verse 37, uh, as it says, let's look at that passage again, verse 37. Blessed are servants, when the Lord cometh, you find them watching, verily, as say, he shall gird himself, make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he come in the second watch or the third watch and find them so blessed is that servant, and know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come and he would have watched, not suffered his house to be broken through. Uh, a lot of that deals with a message that I preached last week, but I want to say something. We need to know that there's a great blessing for God's people when the Lord's return. And may, the God find, may God find us doing what we ought to be doing when he does return for us. And be knowing, so we need to be ready, we need to be knowing, and we need to be prepared for that coming, for the rapture, for his catching us up to be with him. That's verse 40. I skipped over those three verses because I preached on that last week. Verse 3, or verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of the Man cometh an hour that you think not. You know, I lived, I've lived through times when people were picking those times, saying it's coming soon, it's going to come at this time and that time. And the Bible clearly says no man really knows. And for that matter, no man really knows when God's going to take you home. You, it might not be the rapture that we'd be talking about. Uh, the Lord might uh, uh, take us and we just might slip off and you think, well, I just died. Well, well no, if you're saved, your spirit goes straight to be with the Lord. That's, a, that's what's going to take place. That's, that's that wonderful thing that a pastor has. I, I remember years ago dealing with a man that uh, was a young man. He was a young man, a troubled soul. He'd gone through, uh, uh, through adoption and not in his home and out of his home. And, and his response to being rejected was rebellion. And a very nice family adopted him and took him into their family and, and started to raise him. And, it, and it, was, it was going okay, but when that young man hit his teen years, he was full of rebellion. Full of rebellion. Came to our Bible camp. Uh, I spoke to him a couple different times and, uh, and actually dealt with his soul at the, one of the first times he came. Next year he came, he was hard. 
in the Lord, not in the Lord, but in the world. He got filled with rebellion. He got a bitter spirit. At that time, we were still meeting in town. We had a bus. We would run around and pick kids up for the church and bring them to church. And I came one day in the church. A couple of windows had been broken out. And, and it was soon revealed that very young man had broken the windows on the bus. <laughs> he went through a tough time doing things he shouldn't do over and over and over again. And then he would come to me and get right and pray. But he was such a troubled soul. He would get right and it would only be for a short time. And pretty soon he'd go back to his sinful ways. And his parents got, his step-parents couldn't handle him anymore. I hadn't seen or talked to any of them for two or three years. And all of a sudden I got a phone call. And the phone call was from his, his uh, foster dad. He said, I don't know what we're going to do with this young man. He says, we can't even have him in our house. He's, he's doing things in our house we can't have. And he, he was getting violent. And he was, he was uh, and uh, I, I, I gave him a, a, a phone number of a, of, a, of a place down in the, the southern United States where they would take troubled teens and raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And he was very excited about it because everything else was going to cost him a lot of money. And this one was a, a, a place that was Bible-centered, plus it was a lot more reasonable. It was one of those, one of those places. And there's, there's a few who are still around like that uh, at places. And, and so they sent him down there. He was down there for, for three years, two years. At the end of two years, I got a wonderful letter from him. He had repented. He had repented and gotten right with the Lord. Wonderful letter. I was so joyful. Tears. Thought, oh, good. He's right with God. And they sent him home. And his old friends came back. And pretty soon he was right back in the world. And his dad called me. His stepdad called me again. And they put him back in. He was down there for a number of years, a couple more years, and I got another wonderful letter from him. He'd gotten back right with the Lord when he got away from all those, all those friends and all that, and he got right, and he was on fire for God. He was on fire for God. And he said, I'm going to go in the ministry. I want to go in the ministry. I want to go in the ministry. And he came back up, and he attended church a few times, and next thing you know, he, he got lured by a lost woman lost young lady and pretty soon he started right back down the old track into drugs and all these other things and, and I'd visit him and they, I would go over and talk to him and he would he, he knew the language, he knew the words but his life was a mess and he knew it, he knew it he knew it and then he developed a tumor a brain tumor and they said he was going to die and he called me and talked to me and we went through and I went through and he repented and I prayed over him and I laid hands on him and I asked God to take that tumor away and you know he, he had changed he went back into the doctors the doctor said I don't understand it's gone it's gone we can't uh, we don't know what's going on we can't see it on our, on our things anymore we can't see the tumor it's gone and and uh, and it would be wonderful that story ended there, but it didn't end there. Six, six months went by, and he was going right back into the drugs in the world with his wife, and he had encouraged him in the wrong way. And, and uh, about seven months went by, and I got a call from him, and he said, my tumor's back. I'm going to die. I went... And I prayed with him. And I said, God, if he would take it away again, give him another chance. And you know what that young man said to me? No, it's too late. I'm right with God now. And that's good enough for me. Eight months I think it was about eight months went by and I got a phone call and I had been visiting him off and on and he was he was he was good with the Lord his uh, his wife was who she was but he was he was right with the Lord 
He's still only in his early 20s, hardly 21, 22 years old. He said, I'm ready to meet the Lord. He said, I, I don't want to be here. I want to be there. Some more time went by. I got a phone call. Said uh, from his wife. She said, he, with tears, she said he's dying. I went over. He was dying. He was in bed. And I went and talked to him. He could hardly talk anymore. And uh, I went back in the other room and shared the gospel with some of the others in there. And pretty soon his wife came out and she said, he's, he's going to go. He's going soon. I said, I'll pray for, over him. And I prayed over him. I laid my hands on him. And I said, his name. I said, Lord, he's had a troubled life. Remember his beginning? Rejected by his parents? Mixed up in all these other things? He's right with you now. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace towards him. You give him peace at his death. And he had total peace. I pray, Lord Jesus, you take his spirit now to you to be in heaven. Amen. He was gone. As soon as I, I said amen, and he was gone. And his wife begins crying loudly. Tears came down my face because he was prepared to meet the Lord. It was a rocky road. But God set him free. Praise God. Death is not a curse for believers. It's a reward. It's a reward. That's a sad story in a way. But it's a good story in a way. How we finish is important. How we finish is very important. There needs to be a time in our life when we ask Jesus Christ to be our personal Savior and we need to finish well. And even though he had these ups and downs and rock, you know I'm preaching through Psalms and the other side. If you want to see a man that's had ups and downs in his life, you study the life of David. Yet he finished well. This young man finished well. I'm going to see him in glory one day. Well, let's come back to our text. I didn't mean to get off on that. I, I didn't even have any notes about that. But we need to be prepared. For the coming of the Lord cometh at an hour we think not. And Peter asked the question here at verse 41. Then Peter said to him, Lord, speaketh this parable unto us, even unto all. So all of this parable about the, the Lord being ready, be watching, be working, be, be shining, and be knowing, and being prepared. He said, Lord, is this for us, or is this for others? Kind of an interesting thought, is it? Is the promises of God for just me? And a few deacons in the church, or is it for everybody? And of course, they, they're saying, is it just for us, the apostles? And, and the Lord said, Who then is wise and faithful steward, whom the Lord shall make ruler of his household, to give them their portion in meat in due season? It is for all, in other words, who will yearn to be faithful, that wise steward, and, and, and want to be blessed by him and, and, uh, and, to be, and to be receive a reward. For, it's for the saved. So the Lord tells the apostles, it's not just for you, it's for everybody that's saved. And the Lord adds now two prophetic promises. Now, uh, Peter said, you're speaking this parable just to us? No, it's for everybody that's saved. And he adds two prophetic promises. He says in verse 43, Blessed is that servant whom is, when his Lord cometh, he shall find them so doing. Now that young man had ups and downs, but in the end, he finished well. He finished well. 
It would have been a lot worse if he'd gotten saved and then finished bad. At least he finished well. <laughs> you say your evening prayers at night. Do you pray as if it might be your last prayer? Do you ever pray that prayer? Even so, Lord, come. And blessed is that serveth when he cometh, find them so doing. And listen, what was the doing? Working, shining, watching. They were ready. Blessed is the servant when the Lord cometh, he find them so doing. How are you doing today? If the Lord took you home tonight, would you be able to say, he found me doing I hope it's not, he didn't find me doing, I was just uh, taking up space. Just living my life. I wasn't working for the Lord. I wasn't doing nothing for the Lord. I wasn't shining. I wasn't telling others about Jesus. I wasn't even watching for him re to return. I was just, I was just living. And so Jesus says it's for all. And then he adds some prophetic blessings and blessed is that servant when he cometh, the Lord, when he cometh, find him so doing. That's a, that's a truth, and it's rewarded. Verse 3, verse 44, And of a truth I say to he will make him ruler over all that he hath. In other words, he said, I want to find your doing. And if I find your doing, I'm going to give you an extra blessing. Let's be, let's be Christians that are doing. Not remembering doing and then he adds to that verse 45 he talks about the cursed servant who this is a strong passage it runs some three verses 45 through 48 I'll read them as one and then we'll expound upon that a little bit there but if that servant saith in his heart my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men's maiden servants and maidens and to eat, drink, and be drunk. And the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him at an hour that he's not aware and will cut him asunder and appoint him a portion with unbelievers that that servant which knew the Lord's will prepared not himself, neither did uh, do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But they that uh, knew not and commit such uh, worthy things shall be beaten with few stripes. For whomsoever as much is given, much is required. To whom is men committed much, uh, they will ask the more. Now listen, this whole thought here about the thought about the, the curse upon the servants if he delays his coming. He said, uh, and what's the first part of the curse? He says in his heart he's delayed. And so he just goes about his life and he begins to beat the men's servants and maidens and eat and drink and be drunken. Now that's living a life outside of Christ. That's, that's going back to the old way. And there are those rewards that the prophetic promises. Uh, it's not that he loses the reward in heaven, but the Lord of that servant shall come in a day he looketh not for him, an hour which is not away, and he will cut him asunder and appoint him a portion with the unbelievers. Now, I don't mean, I don't know if that means that his portion uh, will be the same as the unbeliever, or his portion uh, is that he is an unbeliever. I kind of think by the next verse it helps us understand this a little bit. Now I want to tell you something. There's a lot of saved people that aren't living for Jesus. There's a lot of saved people that you know. They know the Lord Jesus Christ and their, their life is a mess. I'm not going to ask a show of hands, but you know it's true. And they're not watching for the Lord's return. They're not waiting for His return. Do you know something the Lord's going to take them anyway someday? Either through the rapture or through death. And that servant which knew the Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Whew. What does that mean? Does that mean when the rapture takes place and the people are caught up and those Christians are living like the devil, does that mean that they're going to have a beating that takes place by the Lord? Boy, I sure wish we had the doctor of theology would here so he could explain the scripture away. 
and somehow deny what the scripture clearly says. The scripture clearly says there'll be a punishment. Matter of fact, let me read on here. He shall be beaten in many stripes. Verse 48. But he that knew not and committed such things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with a few stripes. For whom much is given shall much be required. To whom committed much, they will ask the more. In other words, that as I read this, it certainly implies that when the Lord comes, and there are some servants that aren't waiting, they're not watching, they're, they're, they're doing wrong things, they're doing bad things, and some are doing it willfully, and they're going to be beaten with many stripes, and there are some that are doing it just in ignorance, and they're not going to get that same number of stripes. Matter of fact, uh, and did things unworthy of stripes, he knew not those things, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. Now that seems to imply that God is just in his judgment. I want to say this, and I want you to listen closely. We know Christians, we know of Christians that have done bad things. That have gotten away with it. Did they really? Will Jesus hold all people accountable one day? Even the saints of God? Well, I'm the kind of believer that believes that uh, Jesus does all things well, and even in judgment. And when the saints come and when the rapture takes place, every person that's saved and trusted in Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, is going to be up there. And those people that live like the devil after they were get saved and got saved and they didn't obey God and they didn't do those things, I believe once saved, always saved. They're still saved, but they're going to get a licking. They're not going to see the smile of God till it's done. And those that did those things in ignorance are not going to be severely beaten. But they're still going to be there. He said, well, preacher, uh, the way you're saying this, it almost sounds like some of those people that we witnessed to that made a profession of salvation and they seem very sincere at the time, we still might see them in glory. Yes, you might. But if they didn't do right, God will take care of the justice. And some said, well, it was all dealt with on Calvary. He paid the price of it all. Therefore, when everybody gets there, they're white as snow. I don't know. Read the text. You can come to that conclusion. I know many good theologians that believe that. And I'm not going to argue with them. Because maybe they're right and I'm wrong. You say, well, i got to sit under a preacher that doesn't know everything for sure. <laughs> yeah you poor folks I don't know I know what the scripture says and from the way that's laid out it certainly implies that God does all things well God does all things well and the Lord's parable reveals his hidden plan and his purposes for his disciples. And, uh, uh, and we see that. By the way, let me jump back a couple of chapters. Luke 8, verse 10, it says this. And unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, to and others in parables that seeing they, uh, they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And this is reminding us about the parables of God. And when we're looking at these prophetic promises, and we're looking at some of the things that we've already looked at here, uh, and we say, do we know? Well, listen, uh, unto us is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom uh, and others in parables that see that they might not understand. In other words, Jesus by parables reveals his hidden plan and his purposes for his disciples. And some of the things we're talking about here, God is revealing his hidden plans and purposes for his people and for the lost. Mark chapter 4 verse 2 says this, He taught them many things in parables and said unto them, and, and, and said unto them his doctrine. Mark 4 verse 10 through 11, And when he arose and all that were about him, twelve asked him of the parable, and he said to them, It's given you know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without these things are done in parables. Uh, Matthew 13 uh, 10 through 3, And his disciples say, came and said to him, Why speakest thou in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it's given you 
you do know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them is not given, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and to him that hath an abundance more, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even when he hath. Therefore I speak to them in perils, because they see, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither they understand. So all of these things, Jesus uses parables, and, the, and he uses parables to reveal his hidden plan and purposes for all of us. And sometimes the interpretation of some of the certain circumstances that are right here, these teachings that Jesus gives through parabolic ways, we don't completely understand. One day it'll be illuminated to us, we know completely. But one thing we know for sure, we'll be blessed if we find us watching. We'll be blessed if he finds us working. We'll be blessed if he finds us shining. So rather wonder about these other things, let's, let's know what we ought to be doing. And here's the truth, all of us ought to be doing those things and not be wondering about those other things. Jesus will do what's right. So Jesus declares in verse 9, 49 his judgment. Luke 12, 49. I am come to set a fire on earth and I will that it were already kindled. By the way, what's that fire? It's the gospel fire. That word becomes burning in our heart when we get saved. It's the gospel fire. I were, will that are already kindled. Fire. The fire was already burning. Matthew 10, 3, 10. And now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Just, this is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Verse 11. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So listen, Jesus says, he declares, I've come to set a fire on earth, and the gospel is a fire that burns. You say, we're called to be fire spreaders. Did you know that? <laughs> we're called to spread the gospel. The fire of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, may it burn bright that people can see the truth of God. He said, I've come to set that fire. And Jesus declares his delay. But first, I have a baptism to be baptized on verse 50. Now, what's he talking about there? What is the baptism to be baptized of? He's talking about his own death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus said, I long, I long for that, that day of judgment. I long that that fire was already spreading. But he said, but now, first... I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's talking about a death, burial, and his resurrection. For Jesus must first die on the cross. That's his baptism. Luke 12, 50. The baptism he was baptized with was his death. And Jesus said he's straight, and he said, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I don't know what that word straightened actually means, if it was troubled or what it was, but it was, I was fixed until it be accomplished. If I was straightened, I would take an arrow and a line and say, that's, that's, that's my goal right now. I'm straightened to that right away. I've got to go and I've got to take that road to Calvary. John 10, verse 15 says, As the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must also bring. They shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loved me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. This is the commandment I've received of my Father. 1 John 3, 16 says this, Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us that we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren now what's Jesus saying I've got a goal that has to be accomplished for Jesus to save you he has to die for your sins we have a righteous God that says the wages of sin is death somebody has to die for sin Jesus died in our place People without Christ, they'll die in their own sin and they'll go to hell where they deserve. People that are saved are people that said, I accept that Jesus died in my place. Please save me. That's what it is to be saved, is to accept the fact that Christ died and was buried and then he rose again. 
By the way, when we practice baptism, what do we do? We're baptized into Christ. We're picturing our salvation. So we put you under the water as Jesus was placed in the tomb under the earth. And as Jesus came out of the tomb, we come up out of the water. That's why when I dip them in the water and submerge them, submerge them, I bring them up. And I've always done that. Never left them down there. Because it pictures death, burial, and resurrection. By the way, that's what people do after they're saved. Why? They do that because it's commanded. Why? So that we can picture what Christ did for us. Baptism doesn't say it, but it pictures what Jesus did for us. We're picturing his baptism, his burial, and his resurrection. And we're identifying ourselves with it by doing that. And it doesn't save us, but what it does, it reminds us of the cost of our salvation. We're identifying ourselves with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And why does all that take place? Because without dying, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus goes on. Verse 51. Suppose I come to bring, give peace on earth. Nay, I tell you, rather division. For from henceforth there should be five and one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the daughter-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he said also, the people, now by the way, I should stop right there. So the first part of Jesus is preaching here. He said, you think I came to bring peace? He said, no, I'm going to bring division and it's going to take place right in people's homes. What does that mean? That means that in somebody's house, in some people's houses, a mom and a dad will be saved, but the children won't. Or it might mean the mom is saved and the children aren't. It might mean, and in other words, salvation is such a personal thing and a personal choice that people will make personal choices even within a person's house. And the father of the house does not have the power to see the children saved. And the mother in the house does not have the power to see the children go to heaven. And the mother and father together can't do it. Jesus saves. And Jesus saves whosoever shall call upon him. And in that calling upon him, it will end up in, Jesus says clearly here, that, that, it, uh, uh, that peace, no, no, I don't come to bring worldwide peace. And the peace I come won't even be in the house of people that live. It'll be division. Some will be saved and some won't. Praise God my children are saved. And praise God. But you know something? It's getting to be a rarity. And that's why every mom and dad should work diligently to get their kids into the gospel and hearing the truth and hearing it plainly and hearing it clear, cleanly. Because no mama and no daddy wants to see their children in hell. And just because you're saved, it doesn't earn them a place there. They've got to get saved the same way you got saved. And Jesus said, you think I'm bringing peace on earth? You think I'm bringing in household salvation? No, I'm not bringing household salvation. By the way, do you know there are some people that preach household salvation? We had a fellow in the church at Leon came, uh, uh, J uh, John Linton Sr. He believed in household salvation. Had a book out about household salvation. The parents got saved. The whole house was saved. That's not true. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's personal. It's individual. He says, I bring division between the saved and the unsaved. And the division takes place in the homes. It takes place between mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and son-in-laws and, and daughter-in-laws and all the divisions that take place. He said to the people, and he goes on now, and he moves on from that, I bring division. And then he goes on from that, and he said houses will be defined. Then he tells the people to be discerning of the time that they're living in. And you discern the weather, verse 54. 
52, it says this, from this, uh, 52 says, from henceforth there shall be five in the house divided two, uh, uh, three against two, and two against three. That's division. Verse 33, the father divided against the son, the son against the father. And then in verse 54, he said about this, about discerning the time. And he said also to people, when you see a cloud rise in the west, and straightway you say, there's a shower coming. And when you see the south wind blow, there will be heat and come to pass. Now he's talking about predicting the weather. And he's talking about predicting the weather by looking at the clouds. And sometimes we can tell if it's going to rain by the clouds that are coming. And uh, sometimes we can see when the, uh, the blow, wind's coming from the right direction, it's going to warm up. It's going to warm up. Unless you're in Wisconsin, and then it doesn't make any difference which way it blows. <laughs> it's cold all winter. I got an email from a friend of mine, uh, uh, Bill Hawkins, out, in, uh, and he had a picture of his backyard. There's not a lick of snow there. It looks like it's, uh, it looks like it's about uh, uh, August here. And I'm thinking, man, oh, man. I see fortunate. He gives an exhortation, verse 56. You could see the signs and the weather. You could see the signs in the sky and you could discern things, but you can't discern the time in which we're living. Look at verse 56. Ye hypocrites. A hypocrite was somebody that was acting behind a mask. And in the old Greek plays, you might see that once in a while. I remember the old TV shows. They had a TV show, and on the TV show at the beginning, they would have a picture, and I never could figure it out at first, and there'd be two masks. There'd be two masks, one with smiling face, one with a frown face. And that, that was a picture of, of, a, of acting, and the actors used to act when they would act. There might only be two people doing the acting, and when they were depleting one port of uh, sadness, they'd put that in front of their face, and they would talk and, with a smile. And if they saw they'd put the frown in front of their face. This kind of acting has kind of gone a little better, better than that now, isn't it? But the thought of this is, he said, you discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it you can't discern this time? Now I want to ask you something. Can't you discern the time in which we're living today? Don't you see that today is the day of salvation? Jesus has come. He's been buried. He rose again. Don't you see the gospel is true? Don't you see it? Don't you see it? And he, he says this. Don't you discern this age in which we're living today? And he charges the people, why do you even judge not, ye not and uh, do what's right? And can't you just not only just get saved, the time we're in, and he charges the people, why then you yourselves do not uh, judge the life, things in life and do what's right? I'm going to give you an application to this. If you're a Christian here today, are you doing some things you shouldn't be doing? Can't you see that God hates sin? The sin caused him to have to be crucified for your sin? Don't you discern the age in which we're living? Friend, I'll tell you something. Why you judge and do what's right? And uh, the go to thine adversary before the judge is a due diligence to do right to make peace. Verse 58. Goest with thy adversary to the magistrate as thou art on the way. Give diligence that thou may be delivered from him, lest he hail thee the judge, and the judge deliver the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. Prison, he said, Now listen, in life right now, don't you understand something? You ought to deal with this. I want to tell you something as a Christian right now. Listen to me. You're saved right now. That's great. But if you've wronged somebody and you've cheated somebody, get right. Go to the person you cheated, go to the person you're wronged, apologize, and get right. You know, it's one thing to ask forgiveness for God, but you listen, if your brother has ought against you, let's make sure our debts are totally clean. Not just between yourself and God, but between ourselves and our fellow man. And again, remember we are talking about judgment before? Doing wrong things? Listen, let's not owe any man any debt on this earth. Let's not just be right with him. Let's be right with our brothers and sisters. And if we've wronged someone in the past, 
let's do our best to clean the slate. You know, after I got right with God, I did that. I knew some people that I had done wrong to, but I called them up and apologized. And some of the things I did, I couldn't make up for. You know what I mean? I, the, the, the things were gone. Everything was changed. I couldn't do it. I took what I believe was the amount of money that, uh, that to, to pay the due, and I gave it away. He said, well, you didn't need to do that. No, I didn't. But I wanted to do that. Because I wanted nothing between myself and the Savior. Nothing. Nothing. That could keep me from being all that God wanted me to be. I wanted to do diligence to make peace, to do right. I tell you, the judge cast thee into prison, you not get out to pay every might. Verse 59. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid every last might. Now the analogy. If you're a sinner and you do not repent, Jesus is your adversary. And in this life, and in this moment right now, you could get right and confess your sins. And if you confess your sins, Jesus will forgive your sins, for he died for your sin, he was buried for your sin, and he was raised for your justification. The reason I could go to heaven is he paid the price for my sin, he took it to the grave, he was buried with it, and he left it in hell, and he was raised victorious. Today is the day of salvation. If you're saved today, Jesus is your friend. What a friend we have at Jesus. What a wonderful thing to know that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Parabolic saying dealing with the Lord's return. Be ready, be knowing, be prepared. Jesus came to bring peace. Do you have peace today? If you don't have peace today, even as we close, would you bow your head and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Someone said, What's it like to be saved? He gives you a peace. Well, what's that like? I don't know. I can't explain it because the Bible tells me a truth. It's beyond understanding. I can't understand it. You can't understand it. But you can experience it. You can experience it. The weight of sin is gone. The load is gone. What a wonderful truth that Jesus is teaching his disciples as he prepares them as he says this to us, you and I, now if you're here today, are you working? Are you shining? Are you watching? Are you waiting? Are you knowing that God is going to bless us coming? Do you know it could be at any moment? Do you know it could be before you get home today? Are you shining? Are you telling your family and your friends how to be saved? I hope you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for yourself and your son. I pray your words have been a blessing to your people here today. Perhaps there are some here today that uh, need to get the account straightened out. They've got something they need to confess and ask forgiveness for. And Lord, if they do be at this invitation, may they come forward and kneel here in the front and ask you for forgiveness. And I'm so thankful that I can promise them that, that whosoever calls upon you, you will hear. And I can promise them that you will forgive them if they seek forgiveness. And Lord God, I pray you'll bless us now and bless the, uh, the remainder of the service now. In Jesus' name, amen.